Well, good morning and good afternoon for some. My name is Jennifer Joyce, and I am the Regional Vice President of Sales for the Western Territory here at Conducive Technologies. And uh, we're talking with here today about how you can achieve a 2x faster SQL experience guaranteed. So thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is really broken out into two parts. The first part I kind of like to think of as the thought leadership portion of the webinar where we're just going to dig under the hood, you know, just get in under the technology stack to explain what are some of the I.O. inefficiencies that are occurring, you know, some of the I.O. degradation issues that are occurring in the environment if you're running SQL Server, particularly if you virtualize that environment. Uh, and I know I've talked with a lot of people who they're running into so many problems they can't even virtualize it yet. So, you know, we want to get into what's happening under the hood that's stealing the underlying IOPS and that throughput from your environment that's causing that underlying storage sus subsystem to work a lot harder than it needs to be, and ultimately why you may not be getting as much performance as you actually should in your SQL workloads. So thanks a lot for joining us today for this conversation. Uh, you know, there, there are some inherent I.O. penalties that are occurring, and a couple of them that we're really going to bring to light, and, uh, and then once we give that overview, then we'll just be giving a very quick, no more than 10-minute overview of what our software does, you know, it's just set and forget software utility that runs in the background on Windows servers, and it is tackling those I.O. inefficiencies that we're talking about solving so that we can guarantee, at least for our customers, a 2x faster SQL experience. And obviously, the compelling event here is, you know, what other ways can you get performance out of your SQL servers other than having to buy expensive hardware and just throw more and more hardware at the problem? So we are a unique solution to that problem. We can actually solve it with a 100% software approach. And, you know, we're also going to be giving, as, uh, as you would have seen in the invitation, a complimentary NFR that is more than a $500 MSRP value to you after the webinar is over because ultimately the proof is in the pudding. It's where the rubber meets the road. So we're going to get your hands on the software so you can try it for yourself. And on the lines with me is my partner in crime, uh, Senior Director of Systems Engineering, Howard Butler. And for any of you car aficionados out there, if you are ever on a one-on-one -on -one call with Howard, not only does he specialize in accelerating performance in computers, but he's also a race car instructor. So uh, he, uh, he specializes in accelerating fast cars when he has, ever get a, gets a chance as well. So Howard? All right. Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. Always glad to join you here. And by the way, guys, don't let Jennifer's title fool you. She's also quite technical, as you'll find out as we go along here. You know, Jennifer, but there was one thing I did want to mention, and that is we'd like to make this session rather interactive. So there's a Q&A box here in the uh, webinar. And um, as we go through the session, for those of you listening in, if you do have questions, go ahead and write those up and submit them, and we'll do our best to answer those questions during the session or at the end, um, so that way everybody gets all the information they're looking for. So Jennifer, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, and thanks for joining. And yeah, just, just to add on to what Howard just mentioned, when you do type into the Q&A box, and we definitely want to keep this highly interactive, so definitely start dropping your questions in as soon as you have them. We'll, we'll actually start answering questions as we go. Uh, you know, if there's an option there to send your question or comments to all panelists, try to check that option so that we can all see, uh, see what your, your comments are. And you know, don't, don't hold back. If you are thinking the question, probably somebody else is too. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and uh, if I can figure out how to advance a slide here. There we go. All right. So now some of you joining today may not have ever heard of Conducive Technologies. And you may be wondering, well, why in the world does this company think they have any position or thought leadership to be able to even speak on the subject that we're speaking about today? I am not a big fan of when companies spend a lot of time on the corporate slide, so I'm going to get right to the content. Uh, but I do feel it's important that you just know a little bit of what our street cred is and, and where we're coming from. We are actually a 35-year-old software company. And from what we can tell from our research, we are the 12th oldest software company still in existence in the world. And I, I think if you translate that to software, software years, that's, that's quite a long time. Um, we originally started out as a company known as DiskKeeper. Some of you may have heard of that company, and in fact, you may have even used that software in the past for defragmenting hard disk drives. But about five, six years ago, 
the company brought some very revolutionary intellectual property to the marketplace that had absolutely nothing to do with fragmentation. But it was all about how we can reduce the noisy I.O., just all that noisy and unnecessary I.O. And as it turns out, on any given SQL Server system, there's anywhere between 30 to 40% of the I.O. traffic that is just pure noise. It's just stealing IOPS. It's just stealing throughput. And in fact, those customers of ours who add just a little more memory server side take more advantage of our software. And you know, they're, they're offloading up to 50% or more of I.O. from going down to storage and getting well above the 2x faster gains that we're talking about. Now, for this work, Gartner named us Cool Vendor of the Year when we launched it into the marketplace. And now, gosh, we've had this product in the, the marketplace for five or six years now, and it has had very nice market growth. It's now used by over 2,500 mid-market large enterprise customers, and uh, variations of this software are also OEM'd by the likes of Samsung, Dell, SanDisk, Western Digital. So if you haven't heard of us, clearly you've heard of them, and we have a very close relationship with Microsoft and VMware. And Howard, this is a really big one, speaking of uh, Microsoft, I know you were closely involved in this initiative a couple of months ago where Microsoft named us as the first ever software vendor certified for their SQL IO reliability program, and that was a pretty big deal. You know, you're right, Jennifer, and I do consider this a very elite certification. You know, Microsoft has certain levels to make sure that other applications like ourselves are fully compatible with their software, and in this particular case, SQL Server. And as you said, we're the only software vendor amongst this list. But I think we're in pretty good company because, you know, people like EMC and Dell, HP and others uh, have all participated there. And, you know, besides all the testing, we also had to go through a panelist of SQL experts to get past this level and to achieve that level of certification. So I do think this is a pretty significant accomplishment, Jennifer. No, it really is, and thank you for the history and background on that, Howard. And, you know, be, before we jump into, you know, the, the real thought leadership portion of this, it explains what's happening in creating all this unnecessary noisy I.O. traffic. I want to just touch on real quick, you know, this question of what is this I.O. degradation issue that steals performance? Let me just give you first a, a couple of opening slides real quick on some market research that we've done and how broad reaching this impact is. So earlier this year, we just wrapped up uh, what we believe is the largest independent study done on I.O. performance. Over 1,000 IT professionals responded. And we asked one very pointed question. We said, you know, regarding all these hard-hitting apps running on SQL, how many of you have performance problems so bad that you're actually getting staff or customer complaints due to sluggish performance? You know, so you got the slow queries, slow performance, batch jobs taking too long. And, um, you know, if you look at this graph, you're going to see that we hit right in that 28% of all organizations raising their hand and saying, yep, right over here. We've got, you know, some performance bad enough that we're getting complaints. Now, the funny thing is, is we've done this exact same server, uh, this exact same survey question um, in the previous two or three years. and. And we've been hitting right in the same zone. I think last year it was 27%, so it's just creeped up just slightly this year. So this is an issue. So if you're on this webinar, likely, likely it is that you're here because you fall into that 25% or that one quarter of organizations that are actually having this issue. And, you know, we kind of wanted to also do a little bit of a, a question of, of what of all your IO intense apps that you support, which one or ones are the most challenging uh, where you feel like you're struggling and running into the most performance issues? Well, we did a word cloud across the hundreds of responses that we got, and you can see uh, the application's name representative of, you know, the number of times it was mentioned gives it the bigger font, and obviously SQL jumps right out and just surrounded by a bunch of other database type applications. Our sweet spot is really SQL. Um, but, you know, we also want to point out that SQL is running in the Windows context, and our software is designed as a Windows solution. So it will apply to databases and workloads outside of SQL as well. Okay, now let me just move on to this next slide. We're going to keep it moving here. And I think the setup was long enough here. So before I give you a picture of what's actually occurring 
or creating these iodegradation issues that I'm talking about, I think it helps to start with the view of actually what is a healthy IO profile? What does that look like? What is an optimal IO profile where you're getting that optimal performance? Now, as you can see here on the screen, this is obviously a, you know, a very rudimentary extraction of your IO profile. There's a lot more complexity than this, of course. But I think the takeaway is pretty obvious and immediate. You can see that you get nice, large, clean, contiguous writes and reads in this, in this diagram here. And you can see that you're getting a healthy payload of data with every IO operation. You can notice how nice and sequential the nature of your traffic looks. Now, this is an optimal environment to get the best performance from your underlying flash hybrid, disk storage, hyperconverged, and even cloud. But the moment that you take a SQL Server and, and you virtualize it and you put it into this context um, you, and you're running it in the Windows OS, you know, you're going to be able to get this different experience than what we're looking at right here. Right? So what's actually occurring in the environment, we're just going to take a quick look at what's really happening. And I think you can see the immediate takeaway here as well. Suddenly, now in this environment, there's very different IO characteristics. They're much smaller, they're more fractured, and they're more random than they need to be. And what I, you know, I'm going to call this the, our death by a thousand cut scenario. And yeah, I actually did just make little air quotes as I said that. Um, but you know, where your underlying architecture is really struggling to process these workloads and ultimately having to work a lot harder than it needs to. It's kind of akin to pouring molasses all over your flash storage or your hybrid storage or disk storage because now you're, you're penalizing storage performance with what we call the perfect trifecta for bad storage performance, small, fractured, random I.O. characteristics. And I want to make a point here too because a lot of people, when we end up getting on the phone, ask, hey, I've got 100,000 IOPS on my SAN. In fact, Howard and I were talking with someone a couple months ago that came in and said, I've got 600,000 IOPS on an all-flash peer storage SAN. How could you possibly help me with reducing I.O.? And I'm just going to touch on that really briefly because what we optimize is the I.O. you're actually using. So if you're only using 10% of your capacity, but you're using it like this, you are losing 30 to 40% of your throughput. What we do is we take the I.O. that you're actually using, we get rid of 30 to 50% of it, we sequentialize the rest, and turn it into large sequential I.O., and accelerate your throughput by a tremendous amount. So I just want to emphasize there that this conversation really goes and tacks in a different direction than you're used to talking about with IOPS. We're going, what I.O. are you using, and how can you use it better? Now, if we dig in under the hood and we see what's actually going on and what's actually causing this, we can see that there's actually two different what we call I.O. penalties that are occurring that are penalizing your performance and causing those I.O. characteristics to break down or degrade. And they're, they're represented here. Now, I'm going to talk about the one that's on the bottom of the slide first, the I.O. blender effect. Now, the I.O. blender effect, it's likely that you've heard that term. It's a term that we helped Gartner coin a little more than five years ago, maybe six years ago now, when virtualization was coming across the landscape and the IO blender effect is what happens the moment that you virtualize more than one server and you put more than one server on the host hypervisor. Now, on a physical server in a physical environment, this effect doesn't come in because you've got that one-to-one -one translation. But if that physical server is attached to a shared underlying storage, you are going to have the blender effect down at least the storage layer. You just kind of skip the hypervisor level. So this is an issue in those, in those contexts. So, so let's go back to the virtualization context. Once you add a server to that host hypervisor, there is no fix for what happens within that hardware and hypervisor context. And as great as virtualization is for server efficiency, one of the biggest downsides is that it adds complexity to the data path. And what happens is that the host hypervisor now mixes and randomizes otherwise sequential I.O. streams and now delivers to storage a much more randomized pattern. And the moment that you add a third VM, a fourth VM, guess what you're doing? All you're doing is just amplifying the effects of that randomization even further. So you've got this important SQL workload in there that you're trying to process, and it's trying to fight through all of this neighboring I.O. and this I.O. blender effect.
Now, most organizations don't see the full performance penalty that comes with virtualization and that added complexity to the, the data path immediately because, or they don't notice that it's happened, it's crept up on them because they have a tendency to virtualize slowly over time. But some of our biggest and best customers are those that went from 100% virtual to 100%, excuse me, 100% physical to 100% virtual overnight by flipping a switch. Now, Howard, you know, a good example of this was one of our customers that you and I were uh, just on site with not too long ago, Christus Health, and that's one of the top 10 healthcare providers in the U.S. located out of Texas. And they have virtualized one particular environment, over 2,000 servers that were physical and went virtual overnight, Howard. And I believe you actually helped participate in kind of what happened after that event. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. You know, with Christus, they did do their testing on individual systems. Uh, and like many, they expected that what they would get when they went from physical to virtual would be the same kind of performance. But when they virtualized all those systems, they didn't get what they were expecting. What they ran into were a series of performance degradations. And during their analysis, kind of what they found is that it wasn't CPU related. It wasn't a memory constriction. What they actually found is that it was a series of IO bottlenecks, Jennifer. And that's what caused their issues. Now, of course, like most of us here, their first thought reaction was, we're going to have to upgrade all of our storage, and we're going to have to go to an all-flash array to kind of solve this, this type of problem. But before they did that, they had uh, uh, heard about our software, they had gotten a copy, they did an evaluation, and what they found was that we were able to solve their I.O. throughput and bottlenecks, Jennifer. So rather than them spending $2 million for an all-new flash storage array, we were able to save them from that. Yeah, you know, and, and that's an interesting thing, Howard, because, you know, if you go over to our website and, and read the case study on how we doubled performance for them, we were able to, you know, help them keep the infrastructure they had. Uh, so they were able to, again, as you just mentioned, Howard, you know, avoid spending that $2 million for all flash arrays. I think the, the, the purchase order, the, the uh, rec was actually sitting on the final signer's desk ready to be signed, and they threw us in there and solved the issues uh, at a fraction of the cost. And in fact, I think the, uh, the hardware vendor found us at a show and came up and, and had some words with us. But that wasn't our goal. Our goal wasn't to displace any hardware. Our goal was to solve the problem with a software solution that happened to solve the problem. So there you go. Now, as difficult as the, the IO Blender effect penalty is, let's move upstream here a little bit on the slide and go to the Windows IO tax, okay? Now, there's, there's this I would consider even a worse penalty uh, happening here at the top of the stack, and it is coming from the Windows operating system itself. Now, you may be joining in and you may have heard some allusions to this, but we are the ones who can actually explain it because we do have the proprietary, the, actually the only proprietary software pro to solve this problem. And that's the fact that the Windows operating system simply doesn't play well in either physical or virtual environments with a lot of the data from coming out of apps. Now, there's some severe inefficiencies in the handoff of data between the Windows operating system and the underlying storage. There's no APIs that connect the two other than using the rudimentary framework that Windows has always used by addressing the logical disk to write the data. And Howard, this creates a real serious problem because the Windows operating system for any given file that should be written in red with one or two or three IOs, just a minimal number of operations, Windows is ultimately taking that file and breaking it down into much smaller pieces than it actually needs to be in. So ultimately what's happening is you end up in a situation where you're processing four IOs or multiple, multiple IOs for a single file that really should just be written in red with one IO. So maybe, Howard, I'm going to uh, hand this back over to you. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what's actually happening here and why Windows is so inefficient in the handoff of data. Well, you know, the, the Windows file system truly does take kind of a one-size-fits-all approach, Jennifer. You know, when a file gets created or extended and modified, the Windows file system doesn't know how big that file is going to be. And what it does, and this is on the logical side of, of the abstract 
from the hardware. This is how Windows is looking at it through the file system. It looks for the next fixed allocation. And if that file extension is bigger than that next allocation, it'll fill it up, write what it can, and then it has to go and find another allocation. And this progresses so on and so forth uh, until all the data has been written. Well, with each of those allocations, there's a separate individual I.O. request that is sent from the Windows guest VM down to the hypervisor, to the host, perhaps out across the, the network and over to the storage. So as you can see, <clears throat> with all of this extra I.O. traffic occurring, now you're getting these really small random I.O.s rather than large sequential I.O.s. And later on, as we get into how we solve this, um, but you'll see that when you're doing these, these benchmarks and so forth, these small random IOs um, are putting a huge drain on the system. So when you're looking at these benchmarks, and I'll kind of give you two examples here, uh, Jennifer, um, but they give you random IO measurements and sequential IO measurements. And you'll always notice that having nice sequential IOs will outperform those random IO requests. So our solution set, if we can enforce or help Windows to do a better job and do these large, nice sequential IOs, you're going to wind up with the fastest performance for your application as well as your storage. Well, thank you, Howard. And, you know, it, it, one good example, um, is a case study that we published recently with the University of Illinois, uh, and that's up on our website as well. You know, they, their hardest hitting database where their applications were actually, uh, were on some Oracle databases running within Windows, and they also had some SQL databases. Uh, they were already running those databases on the latest servers uh, from Dell, and they had also installed the latest Dell compellent all flash arrays in their environment for those really heavy workloads. And everything was running fine on day one, but about a year in, some of that performance had degraded to the point uh, where they were just going to have to go buy some more flash arrays to get more IOPS to keep up with their SLAs. But before they did that, they, they, in their research, they stumbled across us, threw us in there, and uh, we, we provide that free evaluation. They figured they had nothing to lose, installed it, and we doubled the performance in that environment on top of already existing flash arrays. And they were, they were kind of incredulous. Um, when they saw it. So it, it was really interesting because it, it is a bit shocking to find out how inefficient these systems really are, even when they have the biggest new iron sitting there in the environment under it. Um, now, for those of you wondering, oh, the slide deck's not broken. I will advance the slide now to the next thing. We'll, we'll move on here. Uh, but I did want to just do a quick housekeeping reminder. As you have questions, start dropping those into the box. I'm going to take the first question here from Joe uh, that he typed in right at the beginning. He says, if virtualization I'm sorry, it virtualized, it doesn't matter what virtualization platform you are using. And uh, no, it does not. We are completely um, hypervisor independent. So KVM, Citrix, VMware, Hyper-V, doesn't matter. Uh, we are focused on the Windows VM itself. Uh, so start, to start dropping more questions in, uh, and we'll get to those as we go here. So kind of moving on though, you know, if you take a look here at this next slide, I mentioned that uh, both Howard and I would give just a very quick uh, overview of what our software does. And then we're going to talk to you about the handoff of the NFR that we're going to be giving you so that you can download it and install it seamlessly, literally in about five minutes in your environment, and start seeing the benefits. Uh, but Velocity is IO reduction software. And again, sometimes people go, I have 100,000 IOPS, who cares? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the IO you are using. So we're looking at removing 30 to 40 to 50 percent or more of the I.O. you are using to streamline and get more efficient workloads. It is set it and forget it software that installs right into the Windows operating system. It's a very thin filter driver. It's nominal overhead. We like to call it near zero overhead impact. Uh, we would challenge you to even see the CPU footprint. It's enormously lightweight, and the CPU resources it does use runs at lowest priority, so really it's never going to be interfering with your server performance. And, and what the software is doing is actually offloading I.O. from the underlying storage, and then at the same time, whatever I.O. is left, as, as Howard mentioned, we're streamlining that I.O. traffic, so it's a friendly I.O. profile for your storage to process. It's much quicker. And we do a couple of different things. We have 
we have two patented engines within the software that you should be aware of and what it's actually doing. So we're going to jump into that right now. Now just a ho another housekeeping item, we are coming to the bottom of the hour. We're going to keep going. Uh, if you have to drop off, if you have a conflict, the session is being recorded. Hopefully you can stay on uh, and stay with us for the, uh, the Q&A part, but we're going to move through the rest of the content pretty quickly, but we will have this recorded for you, and if you did have to drop off, we will also make sure you get your free copy of the software, even if you can't stay to the end. Now, Howard, uh, let's move on to slide eight here, and let's start first on what we're doing to optimize rights. Uh, so we already talked about how Windows has this issue where it's only looking for the next available allocation of the logical disk layer, whether it's right-sized or not. Now, we'll give Windows some credit here in the sense that if it's a freshly formatted NTFS volume, we'll probably get some ideal performance on day one, uh, but we've even done some testing and see degradation right after install. Um, but, you know, typically on a freshly formatted volume, you're going to be okay for a little while. Now, the next, in that scenario, the next available allocation is always the right size from that first moment, and you get nice sequential traffic. You can get nice, large, clean, contiguous writes and reads. But, Howard, you know, as time goes on and the files are written and erased, rewritten and extended, that's where this issue really begins to degrade and break down and where the next available space is, Howard, if you're trying to write a 64K file and the next available space is only 4K, it will fill that 4K. It will then split, find the next available allocation, fill, split, rinse, and repeat until the file is fully written. And Howard, we have a patented technology that can actually solve that problem and make sure that what we are delivering with every file is optimal density. So I'd appreciate it maybe if you, you, if you would be willing to share with us just a little bit what kind of intelligence we're adding here to enforce this type of optimization on the Windows OS. Well, Jennifer, you know, as I said before, the file system doesn't really know how big that file creation or extension is going to be. So kind of as you said, it's just looking for the next uh, available allocation. Well, we're doing something uh, rather simple. And in the background, we're able to monitor the behavior of the system, and we're saying to ourselves, hey, this file type or this particular application, when, it, when that file gets created or extended, we know from the behavioral analysis that we're doing in your own environment, as we're monitoring what's going on, we can detect, oh, it's going to be this particular size or it's this many uh, megabytes and so forth. So we just need to really feed that intelligence back to the Windows file system. So Windows can do a much better job in recognizing that, oh, here comes a new file creation or a new allocation. The file system can say, oh, now I don't have to go and use the next available. I already know where the larger chunks of free space are at. So now you're going to get these nice, large, sequential writes as opposed to those small, random, and fractured writes that you described earlier. So now it's very simple. We're just providing that intelligence back to the Windows file system so it can do a better job. So I like to kind of use this analysis or an analogy, Jennifer. Think about this. If you wanted to carry a gallon of water from one place to another, do you want to do that with a hundred small individual little Dixie cups and just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth? Or would you think it would be much more efficient if you just did that operation once with a single large gallon jug? So now what you're seeing is what we're trying to do is help the Windows file system do its job more efficiently. So what you wind up with are nice sequential writes, which again, as we pointed out, are as many times more efficient and more optimum to, to process, Jennifer. Well, thank you, Howard, for that. And, and kind of what I'm taking here is the net takeaway is that this intelligence helps the Windows OS find the best allocation at the logical layers since the next available is rarely, if ever, the right size. And Howard, is, as powerful as that engine in is and as much as that engine alone helps customers, it's not the only thing that we're doing. We have a second engine. I'm going to advance to that real quick. Now, this is a, a read optimization engine, and this engine is very, very different from the first engine. 
This is actually a DRAM read caching engine where we're establishing what we like to refer to as a tier zero caching strategy in your environment simply by leveraging the idle available DRAM sitting there on any given VM or physical server. And we're just utilizing any of that memory that's just sitting there idle and free that's going unused. And I mean, it's wasted. It's, I, I, we could call it leftovers, right? And uh, we're just using a portion of that to serve hot reads. So the real genius in this engine is that it's completely automatic. You don't have to carve out or allocate any memory for cache, and the software is aware moment by moment of how much memory is unused at any given time. In, in really, it's just that unused available free portion that is used to serve hot reads. So that way, you're never having an issue of resource contention. You never have to worry about memory starvation because the intelligence of this engine is just completely dynamic. Now, you know, obviously, if you're writing really heavy workloads and your memory constraint, you're under peak loads, well, then this caching engine just isn't going to kick in and it'll release whatever it's borrowed. Uh, so it's very, very dynamic. But if you're, you know, you've got the, that slightly over-provisioned on memory and you're not using it all, this software is going to put it to work and not let it sit there wasted and idle. And now I know a lot of people, I'm just going to touch on this real briefly because I know a lot of people, sometimes they hear this and they think, well, you know, when it comes to caching, we need to be capacity intensive and really take strong advantage of that, that caching. And Howard, that simply is not true. We have found that if customers can, you know, if they maintain around an average of four gigs of free space available on most of their systems, as most people do, that's plenty for us to serve up to 25 to 50% of the read traffic from, and alleviate it from storage. So it's not always about being capacity intensive because with our behavioral analytics engine, it is so powerful that we can leverage, leverage just a little bit of DRAM. And keep in mind, it is 15 times faster than going down to an SSD. So this tier zero cache strategy, just a little bit of capacity can have a huge impact on offloading a lot of that tiny, small, noisy I.O., just those hot reads that would otherwise have to go down the full stack down to storage and back, we can alleviate that pressure. You know, and you're right, Jennifer. There's two things that are very unique with our IntelliMemory caching, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why nine out of the top ten PC manufacturers have licensed and used our technology on some of their platforms. Of course, you might not have heard of us because they tend to license those under an agreement. Um, but the two things, as you indicated, is the dynamic memory usage. And we'll only use what's free and available. We're not going to cause a memory restriction and take memory away from somebody else. Okay? Um, so we're only going to use that memory that's out there, that's free, that's available. And if any system or user or process needs that memory, we're automatically going to give that back up. Now, the second part is um, our intelligence of what to put and what to keep in the cache for the best benefit. Uh, you know, a lot of caching technologies that are out there and stuff kind of look at it and go, oh, hey, this data was read in. Let me put it in the cache and hope that it gets read in again and, and so forth. We're not doing anything like that. We're actually monitoring the behavior of the system again uh, in the background, and we're seeing what data, first of all, um, that's going to make a difference in terms of satisfying those read IOs from memory. Um, and then, you know, there's got to be some compelling reason for us to, to put it in the cache. It's got to be repetitive. Caching one-hit wonders or, or just, you know, a single IO might help just that one I.O., but it doesn't help in the large grand scheme of things. So we really want to point out that, that we're focused on caching the read I.O. requests that are causing the disruption or causing the performance problem and getting ahead of that. So what we want to be able to do is, is provide the environment such that you get the best possible gains um, and, and so forth. So there's actually all these small IOs that are occurring um, that are kind of gumming up the works. And in doing so, those IOs are what's causing the biggest dent in performance. So if we can provide or offload a significant amount of those, those problematic type of IOs, 
directly from our cache, as you mentioned, satisfying IOs from, from memory, memory to memory data transfers are many times faster than going even to an SSD, that we can get a significant performance boost by satisfying those repetitive reads and prevent that IO traffic from having to go all the way down to the storage. So as you can see, there'd be big performance gains that we can provide and provide that back to, to the applications and users. So we're just going to be offloading that IO traffic in the hopes of it increasing your bandwidth of IO traffic uh, going to the storage and other things that, that need to be used there, Jennifer. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we've kind of finished up the technology portion of this, so if there are questions on the tech, please drop them into the Q&A box right now. I'm just going to get through these last couple of slides, and then we'll go to the full Q&A session. Um, now, you know, if any of you are a Gartner client, you can check in with them. They call us the world leader in DRAM caching technology. We, we can't say that we know for sure we are, but we believe we've sold more caching licenses than any other player in the marketplace over the years. So let me just outline at least some real-world use cases I know. I know we're short on time, so I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll just uh, highlight a couple. Um, but, you know, a good example right here in the middle, ASL mar Marketing, they had a huge import batch job that they would do. It had millions of records. It would take 27 hours to complete. And they simply did not have the budget to rip and replace their hybrid storage with all flash. So they tried our software, and we reduced that 27 hours down to 12 hours. It, you know, um, that, that was pretty incredible. Um, you know, there's another one uh, was uh, – that I wanted to touch on real quick as well, and that was Stockport College. They actually had uh, enrollment crashing, or servers crashing on enrollment day due to IO demands. It was taking them an average of 15 minutes to process one student record. And again, here's another situation where they just didn't have it in the budget to rip and replace their hybrid, and you know their hybrid with all flash. Uh, they installed their software and redropped that 15 minute average down to five minutes and got them back to meeting their SLAs and not crashing due to IO demand. Uh, so with so much success there as what typically will happen, uh, they had another application use case, a long-running payroll batch job on SQL, and they tried us there, and sure enough, it took it you know, from an hour and a half, and uh, it dropped it down significantly. In this particular case, mileage varies. This is not typical. Uh, I'm not going to promise this, but we dropped that one down to 10 minutes. So it just really underscores how inefficient these hardware systems can be processing I.O. And unless you're doing something actively to address your I.O. profile. And, and Howard, I'll just make one last little point here, which I find really interesting, and that is, you know, we used to say the disk was the weak link. That's just not the case anymore. The disk is no longer the weak link. The weak link is now the operating system. The Windows operating system literally cannot hand out data as fast as your hardware can process it. And that's what we come and fix, and we optimize right there at that Windows operating system level. It's a very, very important point. Um, we've got a couple other examples here of, of uh, customers. Again, I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll just touch on one. Alvernia University is a good one for me to pick. Um, you know, you can read the others on your own. But with Alvernia, uh, they have 3,000 students, and they were accessing an LMS package, and students were taking tests, and they were timing out in the middle of the tests. Could you imagine? Due to the I.O. demands. So without the budget to rip and replace the backend architecture, they simply tried the software. We doubled the performance. And more importantly, all of the timeouts stopped. Um, and that's a huge use case is getting rid of timeouts and deadlocks and that type of thing in these, uh, in these environments by just eliminating those I.O. bottlenecks. So let's just take a quick look at what the UI looks like. You can see the, this is what, you know, a screenshot of the software itself. Um, of course, it is just a software utility running in the background and doing optimization in real time. Uh, the only time you ever pull up the UI is just really to see the benefits dashboard to see what the software is doing for you. It's truly set and forget. Actually, it's fire and forget. There's nothing to set. Um, on the screen in front of you, what you're looking at is just kind of what typical median results look like. Um, this particular snapshot is from a three-week time period. And you can see the total IOs eliminated from storage in the top. Uh, middle, and it shows you the percentage, the number, and of uh, what the percentage of read traffic is we've offloaded, and also the write traffic that we've offloaded. In this particular case, our, our averages, we typically see a 30% offload of writes, and we typically see around a 50% offload of reads. So again, mileage varies system to system. Just kind of, and then in the, in the bottom section here, we aggregate the storage IO time you're saving. And, uh, and, you know, kind of the I.O. capacity that we're handing back to your environment. So you're getting to see the real-time savings here. Um, 
And uh, what we recommend is that when you install the software, that you let it run for at least 24 hours for the algorithms to adjust and start collecting the data. Uh, but after it's been running in production for a few days, maybe even up to a week, that's when you can pull up the dashboard and take a look at what it's actually doing for you. Um, so I see some more questions coming in. We're heading right into the Q&A session. So if you have any more questions, drop them in there now. Now, this next slide is very, very important slide. And it is, you know, what we mentioned on helping you get this faster SQL experience with our software. What are the steps? What are the best practices? Okay, step number one is you may not have to add more DRAM. You may already, and most likely you already have plenty on your system. But if not, we're going to possibly look at adding some memory to that system. But we found that 95% plus of systems already have enough. Now we are talking very specifically to a SQL audience, and I know that most if not all of you have very large workloads on those SQL servers. In that one corner case on those really big workloads, we're probably going to want to push the envelope a little bit and ask for a minimum of 16 gigs free. Now you may only be sitting on a system that only has 32 gigs. Again, mileage varies, but I'm going to, you know, someone said how much would you like to give optimal uh, chance for the software to do its thing for me? I'm going to tell you 16 gigs. All right. Now the next thing is step two that we would want you to do, and this is very important if you, you know, this is, and I haven't looked at the Q&A box, so you, there may be questions about this, I may be kind of proactively answering some stuff, but if you do have SQL and you don't have a memory cap on SQL, we're probably going to recommend that you place a memory cap on SQL usage because, uh, you know, once you add more memory, SQL will just gobble it all up. And as we all know, you know, it's highly inefficient in its memory usage. It will cache the whole database if you let it. It's one of the primary reasons why SQL is a sweet spot for us because of how inefficient it really is and how it uses memory. So that's why it's critically important that you cap SQL, you leave that additional memory in the OS for us, for our software, because we'll pick up whatever the OS isn't using and we're going to put it to very, very, very good work. Now, um, if you're on the call here uh, and this is a physical server and you just can't crack open the box and add more memory to it, that's fine. Uh, if that's the case, then all you need to do is just cap SQL a little bit more aggressively to get those types of gains. Now step three, as I mentioned, uh, you'll wait a few days and then pull up the dashboard to see what the software is doing for you. And in fact, uh, we can even at that point schedule a call for you with uh, one of our sales uh, engineers to go over what's exactly the analysis technically on that server and kind of review some of those results with you. So we're just going to uh, kind of close out here and I'm going to tell you what happens next before we go into the Q&A and then we're going to move to that Q&A session. But, but just to let you know, the NFR is going to be sent to you and you're going to have a chance to download and install that. That should take you less than five minutes. There is no reboot required to install this software. Now allow 24 hours for the algorithms to adjust and then pull up the dashboard a few days later and, and, you're, and then you can, you know, check it out and see what it's doing for you. If you're going to start on it, let me, let me just shift to one thing real quick. And that is the second bullet point here, evaluate 30-day trial across all of VMs. Now in this case, um, we do have the option for you to use a trialware. We offer a free velocity management console uh, and you can also do trialware across all of the VMs. I like to think of this as kind of our, our multi-tiered deployment approach. I'm just going to mention here real quick that I have seen a number of times where somebody deploys what I call a level one deployment. They deploy only to the SQL server, only to the database where that work is happening that they're trying to improve the performance on. And I'll be very honest with you, I see that 10 to 20 percent of the time we will resolve that performance by deploying only to that one server. We may need to go to what I refer to as a level two deployment. A level two deployment is what I refer to as going to either all of the VMs on that host, getting rid of that IO blender effect, but more importantly, especially in the case of SQL when you have multi-tier architecture and you've got maybe you've got the, the web server and the app server, proxy server, you've got the domain control, you've got all of these data points. Think of it as a relay race, that that baton, the data, is getting handed off from server to server to server. In about 60 to 70 percent of cases, 
I've seen that we need to go to that level two deployment to get that result. You may want to deploy on all three servers supporting that application, not just the database server, because there is latency being added at every step of the way. Even if the other servers aren't pushing tons and tons of I.O., they still have to touch the data. They're still adding latency, and that's where I see a lot of benefit. That's where this trial comes in. You can go ahead and get the Velocity Management Console. You can deploy the software as broadly as you want. You could even deploy it to what I refer to as the Level 3 deployment, and that's universal. Touch every single workload. Imagine what it could do if you were able to remove the I.O. from 30 to 50 percent of all of the I.O. from every single VM in the entire environment and offload that much I.O. from your underlying sub-storage. It is very powerful. It is a force multiplier, and you can do that with the trial. So I'm going to say right now, and there's one other tool I'm going to mention, but if you want that Velocity Management Console and that broader free trial that we offer, type into the chat box right now. Uh, VMC, that stands for Velocity Management Console, and we will make sure that in addition to your free NFR that you receive the Velocity Management Console. So again, VMC. The other tool that I'm going to mention to you guys is not really highlighted in this webinar here. It is called the Conducive I.O. Assessment Tool. This is a free tool, and I'm going a little bit over. I wasn't planning to talk about this, but I'm going to mention this on this call. The Velocity uh, Conducive I.O. Assessment Tool. You don't have to install anything on the target servers to do this free assessment. You install the, the I.O. Assessment Tool on one server, and then you point it at the target servers. And you're just going to put in the IP address or the server name, and it's going to use remote uh, WMI calls to collect existing Perfmon data from those target servers. So no agent, nothing's installed on the targets, and you get a free IO health check to see if your servers are even candidates in the first place, and it also gives us a sneak peek on this pre-assessment to see what your memory profile looks like. So you're not guessing. We can go in and recommend to you immediately the type of uh, memory profile adjustments you may want to consider on those SQL servers to get the most success out of Velocity. So if you want the I.O. assessment tool, type in I.O.A.T. Again, VMC or I.O.A.T. And if you want both, just type in both. And we'll make sure that you get all of that after the webinar. So that is, uh, that is really the content that we wanted to get through. Um, and, and Howard, I think we should jump right into the Q&A. We're a little bit over time, but I wanted to come back over to you real quick and uh, see if there were any things, any points on the software or anything like that, that that we needed to get to before we jump into some of the Q&A that I see here in the box. You know, Jennifer, I think you covered it quite well. Um, you know, with the questions that I start seeing popping into the Q&A box, I think we should just go there. Okay, so we've already answered Joe's question. I'm going to hop right to Frank's question. He says, now, pa pardon me if I read these wrong. It's the first time I'm reading them, so I may stumble. But it says, uh, so we just recently went to a VM environment for our SQL ERP system, and we went to an SSD SAN with NetApp. So can this product still help? You know, I'll go ahead and take that question. The answer is absolutely yes, we can help. Um, the underlying type of storage hardware, the fact that it's a NetApp filer, uh, and, and so forth, really doesn't make any difference to us. We're focused on the Windows side of things. In that Windows guest VM environment, that's where that level of inefficiency begins its journey. So if we can help Windows do a better job, then all components further downstream are also going to be able to take advantage of that and do a better job. Okay. Thank you, Howard. So Michael, I'll answer this question. Michael asks, what is the lowest MS SQL Server version that your software works with? Will it work with MS SQL Server 2008 R2? Yes, it will. 2008 R2 64-bit is the lowest version it works with, and it, will, it is compatible with everything higher. Uh, Frank has a question. He says, does this help, and Howard, I'll, I'll uh, turn this one to you. Does this help non-VM SQL performance? Yes, it does in the context of if there is a mixed environment where you have Windows and non-Windows virtual machines, okay, and those machines are doing their I.O. traffic through the same common hypervisor and host and back-end storage. If we can eliminate a good portion of the unnecessary IOs that Windows is generating, then you'll get an indirect benefit from those non-Windows 
platforms as well because there's going to be less IOs that have to be contended with. Great. So we have a question from Mr. Fernandez, and he says, so this software gets, I'll answer this one, so this software gets installed on the VM hosting, the SQL instance, or the virtual server host. So this gets installed on the VM itself. We do not install anything at the host level. Uh, and this is the case as long as it's a Windows VM. And guys, this applies to VDI as well. Uh, it's huge on VDI workloads to be able to get this kind of optimization, if you, even if you've got link clones or master gold image. Uh, but yes, this is installed directly on the VM, uh, not on the host. Um, Joe asks, do you have a guide to what the software entails? That's kind of a, a really broad arching question. Uh, we do have a lot of different white papers that go really deep. We've got high-level product brochures, so yes, uh, we absolutely have guides. We also have um, installation guides to get hands-on, um, you know, firewall settings, setting up the Velocity Management Console in addition to live support. Um, if you want to get into the weeds with one of us on the phone, we can certainly walk you through a lot of that as well on a custom call. Um, and, uh, oh, I see Joe, Joe uh, clarifies the question below, software and yes, yeah, I think Oh, the install. Okay, so I think I've answered that. Um, okay, so the next question says, can this tech be applied to Oracle Database? Howard? So long as that Oracle Database is running on a Windows platform, then yes, indeed, we can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, the next question from Mike, is this limited to MS SQL Server or will it work for other DBs like SQLite or Oracle or MySQL? Howard, over to you. All SQL instances. And in fact, it's a little bit of a misnomer, even though this, this webinar was strictly driven on those of you running SQL. Um, the nature of our software and our solution is not SQL specific. We work within the framework of Windows. So regardless of the type of database you have, as another gentleman had, had um, mentioned earlier about Oracle, we work extremely well with Oracle, with Exchange, with SQL, with SQLite, um, the MSDE, um, all of those different databases because we're focused on the behavior of Windows. So even custom written software applications will also get benefit because they're doing IOs. And that's the heart of our solution is IO avoidance or elimination. Great. Now, there's a couple more questions I see we're going to touch on. So if, if your question hasn't been typed into the box yet, go ahead and get that, because as soon as we get to the last question, we will end the webinar. Uh, Joe has a question, Howard. He says, so the database can be running when you install? Absolutely, yes. There's no need okay. to shut down the database. There's no need to plan for a reboot. Uh, it's just simply uh, either an interactive install, if you're just putting it on one or two machines, or if you want to take advantage of our Velocity Management Console, you can set that up and use the Management Console to do deployments to other machines within your environment. But yes, you can do those deployments while all your users are still doing their normal day-to-day -day work, databases open, doing their things. Uh, it's pretty transparent in the background. Fantastic. Now, um, I haven't scrolled down to see if more questions have come in, so I'm going to invent a question for you, Howard, which I'm guessing at least one person listening is, is thinking, what about uninstalling it? Can you uninstall it cleanly without a reboot as well? Yes, you can. Great. Joe has a follow-up question. He says, does it help on the actual web application server too? Well, on that web application, if it's generating I.O. traffic, then yes, indeed. It's all about the I.O.s. And if we can uh, reduce the I.O. traffic footprint, then every component in your environment benefits from that. Okay. Now, Howard, there's a question here from Joe Clark, and he says, after installing, I found that application performance actually got worse. Is there something that can be done to help the ac application, applications work better together? Um, well, I don't necessarily understand the, the, the question in terms of if you installed our software and the application performance got worse, I'd be making, uh, checking to make sure what is it that we're actually measuring because workloads can fluctuate and, and vary from time to time. So I'd be looking, curious and looking at uh, maybe taking that question offline and trying to figure out exactly what was happening there. But usually it's just a simple matter of, you know, does the system have adequate amount of memory? 
were we able to harness and utilize some of that free available memory? And in doing so, did that help reduce the I.O. traffic or allow the system to do more, more product, uh, productivity type of work? And Howard, I think I would have answered that question the same way too. So what I would recommend, uh, Dawn, if we can make a special note for Joe, and let's go ahead and, and have a call scheduled with him and one of our technical engineers so that we can get a hands-on assessment of exactly what factors are happening in that environment. Um, so we have another question here. I actually can't read it. It's not showing in the window properly. It's, it says IOAT, if, it, if it's an IO assessment tool, why do we even need, and then I can't, I literally can't read the question. It's not showing in the window. Can you see that one, Howard? I don't see it either. Um... Okay. Well, Dawn, if you're able to extract what that, the rest of that question is, maybe you could email it over to us and we can answer it. We're going to move on to the next question while we try to, while we try to um, keep going, since I can't read what the question says. Um, VDI meaning on the actual non, okay, so uh, Howard, Joe has a question. So from my comment earlier on uh, being able to run this on VDI, he makes a comment. He says meaning on the actual non-persistent desktop, if you wouldn't mind clarifying for us. Uh, sure. In a VDI context, our product works equally well whether it's persistent or non-persistent environment. So you would install or make uh, our solution set part of that standard image, so when a VDI client is, is launched, um, our drivers and file filters are already part of the stack, part of that Windows uh, uh, startup, and uh, we'll be able to immediately begin reducing the I.O. traffic, uh, regardless of persistent or non-persistent VDI platforms. Okay, great. Well, I'm having trouble with my, my windows. If the question's too long and rolling off of more than one line, I'm not being able to read the whole question. I do see a comment from Joe that starts, I wouldn't be opposed to speaking with someone about, and then it cuts off. Um, Sergio has a quick question. It says, does this work with Infineo? So, Howard, I'll come back to you on that one. Yes, it does. There's no conflict between the two solution sets. They're quite different, although uh, just from a, a general viewpoint, we're both after trying to uh, optimize and reduce I.O. traffic, we do it at the Windows Guest VM level, which is where the I.O. is, is formulated, and that's our first line of defense there. Okay, great. And we got Sergio, does it play nice with Nutanix? Yes, it does. And, and again, keeping in mind that we are installed right in the Windows operating system, we are fenced by Windows. If it is compatible with Windows, it is compatible with us. So you can kind of fill in the blank. Uh, is it compatible with fill in the blank? And as long as the answer is, is it compatible with Windows and the answer is yes, we are also going to be compatible. Uh, we have another question, no, re re no reboot needed uh, to the server after install. That is correct. Frank's question is too long for me to read in my limited window. Howard, are you having the same issue or can you actually read Frank's question? I can read, I can read Frank's question there. Frank uh, is asking for clarification on non-VM. He says, we have a SQL database on a physical server connected to the NetApp, so does this improve the I.O. on the physical SQL server? And the answer is yes. Our product can be installed and used on both physical and virtual Windows systems. Okay, great. I'm not sure I understand Joe's question, so you could see a big difference on a – oh, it's because it falls off the line. I'll, Howard, I'll let you read these because I'm not being able to read them. I can just see the first line. Uh, he's talking about a, a document management server. So, yes, we do have customers using it um, with those type of applications. The answer is yes, we will provide a, a big benefit in that type of environment. Okay, and Howard, I think Frank's got another question after that. I think it was just really just a comment uh, mentioning non-Windows um, uh, part there. Like I said, from a non-Windows environment, there's, there's nothing for us to install because it's not a Windows platform. But again, if those non-Windows platforms are tied into the same infrastructure where you do have Windows systems, then you have I.O. traffic occurring from Windows, you have I.O. traffic occurring on the non-Windows platform. And so you, you have this blender effect of all of these disparate type of I.O. threads occurring. If we can optimize those that are coming from Windows, then even those systems where we're not installed, those non-Windows platforms potentially can get a benefit because of the Perfect. overall overall reduced I.O. traffic. 
kind of have the rising tide raises all ships effect there. Exactly. Joe looks like he, uh, he comments that he has a call later with a technician. I can't read the whole comment because we're coming up to the top of the hour. I'm going to get to the last couple things here. Ray, there is volume discount pricing. What's not asked is how do we license. I will answer that proactively. We can license either by VM or by host. So kind of those levels I was talking about, level one, you just focus on the one server. Level two, you focus on you know, everything on the host or everything in the data path. You could use per VM for that. And then level three, if you want to go universal and just use it in your whole environment, you can license by host. You get a lot of cost savings that way. So you can go either way. And yes, there is definitely uh, attractive volume discount price breaks if you're expanding uh, beyond just a handful of machines. Um, and then we've got another question, Howard. Um, just 20 seconds on this one so we can wrap it up. Encrypted data keys, will they get impacted, if at all? No impact whatsoever will work uh, quite well with encrypted data keys. Encrypted volumes um, works just fine. Guys, I really want to thank everyone for attending today. This has been a successful webinar. We've had a ton of Q&A. We really appreciate your participation. We really hope we were successful in not having this be another boring IT webinar. Uh, we hope that we were able to give you some exciting new ideas today that you're going to give the trial wear a try. Uh, get in there, get under the hood, roll up your sleeves, kick the tires, test it out, see what it can do for you, and we will be standing by to schedule calls with you as needed afterwards. Howard, thank you for your expertise, and Dawn, thank you for hosting, and uh, that's a wrap. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. You will receive your free copies and recording of the webinar after the session is over. Take care.